السلام عليكم I'm doing good. How are you? Uh, um, brother Omar, I have one question. Just yeah. like one. So I understand as of like the current world, uh, Egypt is a Muslim country. Egypt? Yeah. And that's like part that's like in Africa too. Yeah. So did the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi did he ever travel to Africa? Travel to Africa? That's a good question. Um I, I don't think so. As far as I've read in the Sira, I don't believe he traveled to Africa. Yeah, there's there's a lot of Muslim countries in Africa and you know. Yeah, the Sahaba actually traveled. So after the Prophet passed away, then the next you know, Khalifas, they expanded the Muslim empire, traveled to Africa, um, uh, even like parts of Europe, uh, and like uh, China as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's all I need to know. Yeah, inshallah, next week we can uh, start the, or next week is Thanksgiving, right? So probably the week after, we'll start the uh, for Khulafa history of them. I'm just trying to open. <laughs> okay. So, uh... All right. Smith <laughs> Manarheem. Um, you're able to see my screen? Yes. Okay, so Surah 6, 160. Have you used this website before? Uh, Quran.com? Um, I don't think so. I might have, but I don't think so. Okay, yeah, it has. It's pretty nice to search up any eye of the Quran. Yeah, I'll keep it in mind. Quran, is this Quran.com? Yeah, yeah, very easy to remember. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Sylvan. I know what you do that day. No, this is not the right one. Nine seventy two. Okay, so we're on Surah Nine, Surah Toba, mm -hmm. verse seventy two. Uh, just an interesting note about Surah Toba. It's the only Surah in the Quran where there is no uh, Bismillah before it. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, Surah Toba. It's the ninth surah. Let's see if the translation does that also. Yeah, you see? <laughs> it just says Surah Toba, and then it goes straight to the first ayah. So Why? That's, yeah. yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> well, uh, the scholars of Quran said that the reason is because um, this surah is really talking about um, basically, the mood of the surah is very serious, and it's very, um, you could say you could you could uh, experience or you can understand the anger of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala through the surah for those who um, you know disobey Him, for those who fight against the believers, uh, the hypocrites. Right? Do you know what a hypocrite is? Not yeah, like someone. It's someone who says that they'll do something, but they actually don't do it. Yeah, or someone so, that, yeah. Yeah, so specifically, or you could say technically, 
when we're talking about hypocrites in, in the Islamic um, context, it means someone who says they're Muslim, but deep down they're not. That's a, that's a hypocrite. So, you know, this surah talks a lot about them because they used to uh, go against the, the believers so many times. They used to say we're believers and then they used to give secret information to the uh, to the Meccans and plot against them and, uh, you know, commit treachery and um, deep down they were not real believers. Uh -huh. Okay, so let's look at this surah, I mean this verse. Allah has promised the believers, both men and women, gardens under which rivers flow to stay there forever and splendid homes in the gardens of eternity and above all the pleasure of Allah. That is truly the ultimate triumph. That's the ultimate victory, ultimate success. So in this oh. verse, this verse Allah is saying that Allah has promised the believers. I mean, whoever is a believer, he promises them. And Allah never breaks his promise. Allah promised them gardens under which rivers flow, beautiful gardens, and to stay there forever. So sometimes we think like, how long is forever? Right? Did, you, did you ever think about that? Like going into paradise forever. Um, some people, they kind of get overwhelmed or a little, uh, it's hard to understand what does forever mean. You know, won't we get bored? Won't we, you know, want to do something else? Uh, forever is just such a long time. But no, Jannah is a place where every single moment or every single day is better than the previous day, right? So, for example, if, when we go on vacation or we, when we do something fun, we know eventually it's going to end and we're going to go uh, back to our daily routine. And it's just going to, you know, we, we know that deep down. Whenever we're having some enjoyment, we know later the enjoyment is not going to last. Um, but in Jannah, every single moment and every single day is better than the previous one. So they said that even the fruits of Jannah, every time you eat it, it gets better and better and better. So you never you never get bored. You never um, uh, you never feel like what is the purpose of life? Because if you you know there are some people who they just get more and more wealthy. They just get more and more rich. They um, they just keep wanting to get a bigger and bigger house and more and more millions of dollars until they reach such a level of um, uh, such a level of wealth. Well, they 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 don't know what else to do. They get they get bored. They get bored of being so wealthy. They get bored of being able to have everything they want. But in Jannah, they'll never be bored. They'll never. Um, uh, th there's never an end to their fun. There's never an end to uh, their enjoyment or pleasure. So this, you know, especially if you look at the, um, you know, the really sad reality uh, and the destruction that you know the Muslims in Palestine are facing, or you think about any difficulty that people are facing as an individual or a group, they have these verses to kind of, you know, give them some hope. Because right. if, if, if people are just living in this world and they don't believe in something after, then in their minds and in their hearts, that's that's the end of it. They had a terrible uh, end to their life, and that's it. I mean, that's extremely sad. But we say no. That's, There's nothing that's... positive to look forward yeah, to. Yeah, exactly. There's nothing positive. But if, if we know that, okay, they suffered so much, but in reality, they may have suffered for a year, they may have suffered for, you know, their whole life, which is 80 years, or they may have suffered for just a moment. But even 80 years, you know, imagine someone had a very terrible, miserable life. They went through so many difficulties for 80 years. But here Allah is promising them that you will be in beautiful gardens and mansions and palaces and kingdoms well, you will have everything that you ever wanted. You'll be able to meet your family who passed away, uh, your future generations, meet the Sahaba, the Prophets. You'll be able to eat anything you want. You'll be able to you know, converse with the Prophets, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
and you'll have that forever. Not 80 years, not, you know, 200 years, a thousand years, million even, just forever and ever and ever. So if you compare 80 to infinity, it's almost like you're comparing, you know, nothing. It's like you're comparing zero to infinity. This is to give them that, um, you know, you'll see if you've seen some videos or heard some statements of the people in Palestine, they are, they speak with such, like, such faith and such hope. They, they're, you know, they're like smiling and speaking, you know, that, you, oh. know, uh, you know, in Jannah I'll have this and in Jannah I'll, able, I'll be able to, you know, see my, see my parents again. And they're just, they're just smiling, talking about Jannah. And while, meanwhile, they're just sitting in a war zone. That's that's amazing. That's nothing you can find um, in any other society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I uh, saw one of the videos and it was a man whose brother had just died and he wasn't sad at all. He was like, I'm happy because my brother has been returned to Allah. So. Yeah, that, that's just amazing. I mean, you know, we, we see that and we hear that and we think like, if I was in that situation, how would I react? But Mashallah, they they really understand these verses. They know that these verses are real, and even more so, Allah said that the one who dies in the path of Allah, they're they're not dead. Allah said, don't say that they're dead. They are being given provision and sustenance, meaning they're given they're being they're being provided for, um, while while they're you know physically dead. But said they're not dead. They're eating and drinking and enjoying. Mm -hmm. So yes. Subhanallah. You know, 10, 12. Yeah, okay. This is a good. Whenever someone is touched by hardship, they cry out to us, whether lying on their side, sitting, or standing. But when we relieve their hardship, they return to their old ways as if they had never cried for us. Uh, to us to remove any hardship. This is how the misdeeds of the transgressors have been made appealing to them. What this verse is saying that there are people, and naturally, the, the, there's you know not just disbelievers, but kind of people in general. But this is talking more about you know the uh, the, the characteristics of disbelievers. That whenever they go through hardship, they cry out to us. I mean, these people, whenever they go through something difficult, someone's about to, you know, die, someone's about to, you know, they're in a great danger, or they're just in such such, such sadness, then that's when they make dua to Allah. That's when they ask Allah to, to remove their difficulty or to, you know, fix whatever is broken, etc. But then once Allah answers their dua, once He you know, removes that difficulty, He fixes all the problems that they have, then they go back. They go back to their old ways. They forget about all that difficulty. They forget that they used to make dua. So Allah is describing, you know, like how how can someone who is going through difficulty, basically Allah is saying, I helped you in your time of need. And then what did you do after that? You just turned the other way and you, you ignored and you acted like nothing ever happened. You can imagine, <laughs> imagine if if someone did this to us. Or if we did this to someone, right? Imagine if we are, imagine if someone is in extreme difficulty, right? And they ask us, they beg us for help. And then we help them. And as soon as we help them, then they forget about us. They don't even talk to us. They they may even like talk bad about us. Imagine that, right? So imagine how how that would make us feel. So this is, this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's helping all these people. But as soon as he helps them, he, they just go back. They go back to disbelief. They go back to sin. They go back to forgetfulness of their Lord. Mm -hmm. 1287. So that's Surah Yunus, named after the Prophet. <laughs> Surah 12 is also named after the Prophet. <laughs> Okay. 
This is Yaqub alayhi salam said to his sons, go and search for Joseph, meaning Yusuf, and his brother. And do not lose hope in the mercy of Allah, for no one loses hope in Allah's mercy except those who, those with no faith. So here Allah is saying that losing hope, no one loses hope in Allah except those who have no faith. So except those who are disbelievers. Saying every believer will never lose hope in Allah. This means if you're going through difficulty, if you are, um, if you are, if you committed a mistake, right? You committed a sin. Um, you'll never lose hope. You'll always, you'll always, you know, turn back to Allah, and you'll know that He'll forgive you. Sometimes some people they they you know do so many bad things that they think, oh, Allah will never forgive me. But here, Allah is, is quoting Yaqub as I'm saying that Allah uh, that. Uh, Allah will always forgive if someone wants to forgive. Allah will always help if someone wants, if someone asks him for help. Right? Never, never lose hope. Uh, sometimes you don't think it like losing hope is is a part of is a, is against faith. Losing hope is against Islam. You're supposed to have hope in Allah. Uh -huh. yeah. Seventeen sixty seven. Yeah, and this is similar to the one we did before. It says, when you are touched with hardship at sea, <laughs> at sea, you totally forget all the gods you normally invoke except him. But when he delivers you safely to shore, you turn away. Humankind is ever ungrateful. So this is kind of similar to the to the two verses ago, right? It says, when people are, <clears throat> people are on a ship and they're sailing, and while they're sailing, there's a storm that comes and it, you know, it puts them in a high risk of sinking and drowning. Then they make dua, oh Allah, uh, uh, <coughs> forgive us and save us. And they, they forget about all these other gods they used to worship, right? This is talking about those polytheists, the idol worshippers. So they, at that time of difficulty, they forget all their idols. They only call to Allah alone, right? As we do. Only one God, but once He, <coughs> once He saves them from sinking, He saves them from sinking, and He makes them reach the shore safely. They go back. They go back to calling those other gods. They go back to worshiping other gods other than Allah. This is similar to that that previous one. Twenty forty three. Surah Taha. <clears throat> Surah Taha is, uh, all the surahs are beautiful. Surah Taha is also a beautiful uh, surah. It has the story of Musa alayhi salam. So if you get a chance, you can, uh, if, and if you would like, I can share with you the stories which have, um, sorry, the surahs which have stories of the prophets. Surah Taha is one of them. So <laughs> So Allah is commanding Musa Sam, He says, go both of you. Do you know who is referring to by saying both of you? <laughs> Allah is commanding Musa and someone else. I'm sorry? Here, in this verse, Allah says, go both of you to Pharaoh. Do you know who he's referring to by saying both of you? Uh, I believe it's Musa and... Oh, I forgot his brother's name. Yeah, you know, his brother. His brother's name is Harun. Yeah, Harun. Yeah, Moses and Aaron, they say. So he said, go both of you to Pharaoh, for he has truly transgressed. Speak to him gently, so perhaps he may be mindful or feel fearful of my punishment. So the Pharaoh that's being talked about here, do you know some of the things that he did to... Uh, the people of Musa alayhi salam? Well, I know that he enslaved them. Yeah. Uh, he killed other babies at one yeah. time. Yeah. And by the way, these, uh, the, 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 the people that he enslaved and he was killing, these were uh, Bani Israel. 
meaning uh -huh. they were you know like the the Jews that we that we know of except back then they were true believers and they believed in Musa so those people were enslaved and they were killed like this <clears throat> unfortunately they're they're doing the same thing that Pharaoh, the Pharaoh did to them they they've imprisoned them in an op open air prison and they they're killing everyone including babies so anyway so he did that right Allah is commanding you two prophets Musa and Harun speak to Pharaoh gently how does this make sense that this person is so evil and so powerful and Allah is commanding his prophets to speak to him gently what do you think Speak to him gently. So that means like uh, speak to him kindly and speak to him um, mindfully. Yeah. So why are they supposed to be speaking kindly and gently to such an evil man? Why don't they just go and speak to him harshly or, you know, just go and attack him or just go and execute him? Um, so that he can maybe... So then like... Tensions won't rise, maybe, and also, so then, um, it says also, like, so perhaps he may be mindful of me or fearful of my punishment, exactly. Yeah, because if you if you just go and you know, if you fight fire with fire, it's, it's a very low chance of getting anywhere, right? Trying to speak to this person who says he's God, Pharaoh's, Pharaoh said that I am God. So try to try to go to him and and like speak harshly and try to you know speak roughly and fight him. Uh, it's not gonna do him any benefit. He's just gonna come back even harder. That's what happens with arrogant people. But uh -huh. if you speak to him gently, then perhaps you know he'll 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 reach he'll touch his heart. But besides that, <clears throat> so that's one amazing thing, because this shows that Allah gives everyone a chance, even the Pharaoh who is so evil who is. Um, who thinks he himself is God, even to him, Allah gives him a chance. Said, oh, my prophets, Musa and Harun, go to him, speak to him gently, give him a chance. Perhaps he'll, you know, that way he won't have an excuse. That way on the day of judgment, we will tell him that we sent you messengers and they spoke to you kindly and they invited you to the true uh, belief and you still disbelieve. So that's one amazing thing. Another thing is we learn here that whenever we're talking to people about religion or whenever we're trying to correct people or bring them towards, you know, uh, bring them towards Allah, speak to them kindly, speak to them gently, even if, even if, you know, whatever their personality is. Because if you have the worst of the worst, Fir'aun, and you're speaking to him gently, then what about like a normal Muslim or non-Muslim? who may be doing something. So this is, unfortunately, a lot of people, they, they don't realize that this is the way you're supposed to talk to people about religion. You don't go to the masjid and you see someone doing something wrong and you just start yelling at them or start right. correcting them, embarrassing them in front of everyone. What's that going to do? That's going to push them further. You go you go to the masjid and, you know, um, you see someone maybe not praying properly or maybe not dress properly or whatever, and you start shaming them in front of everyone, you yell at them, you say, what kind of person are you? What kind of Muslim are you? This is going to push them further. Then they're never going to come to the masjid. And they're going to associate bad feelings towards other believers just because of this one person. So always speak gently, kindly, um, with wisdom. That's the main thing. Speak with wisdom. That's that's how the Prophet spoke. That's how he addressed people. Okay, um, and then last verse of the Quran that we're going to talk about 3953. Okay, <laughs> say, O Prophet, that Allah says, O my servants who have exceeded the limits against their souls, do not lose hope in Allah's mercy. For Allah certainly forgives all sins. He is indeed the all-forgiving, the all-merciful. 
This is also similar to the other verse that said, don't lose hope, right? It says here, mm -hmm. servants who have exceeded the limits, meaning those servants who have done so many bad things, that they've went beyond. Still, you people should not lose hope in Allah's mercy. You should know that Allah can forgive all sins, and he forgives all sins. This means no bad, no no matter how bad a person was before, if they ask Allah for forgiveness, he will forgive them. Right? Mm -hmm. um, now, this doesn't mean that if you if someone has you know harmed other believers or they they've stolen, they've killed, they've done all those things that they're just gonna be let off the hook. They're still going to be responsible for that in the world, meaning they will either go to jail or they will get some sort of punishment. They have to return the money that they stole, etc. They have to do all that. Okay. Mm -hmm. But besides that, they ask for forgiveness and they they you know basically fix whatever they've done in the world. After that, they'll be forgiven. Mm -hmm. It just shows how how forgiving Allah is. Okay, let's quickly go through the few hadith that I've shared here, so you're able to you know, to follow along here. Right? And let me zoom in a bit. Okay, so Hassan, why don't you read the hadith and we'll explain it a bit. You can read this first one. Okay. Uh, okay. There is no Muslim that makes a dua in which there is no sin or breaking of family ties, except that Allah will give him for it for in one of three things. Either he will answer his prayer promptly or he will save it from the hereafter, and he will, or he will remove some harm because of it. The companion said, then we will make abundant dua. The Prophet Muhammad said, Allah grants even more. Yeah, so mashallah. Remember, I think last week we talked about dua and what happens. Right, right. Yeah, so here, this is the hadith that Prophet said. If someone makes a dua, so they don't make a dua for something sinful, right? Someone makes dua for something against Islam, that's different. Someone makes dua for breaking family ties, meaning like um, uh, some dua that is going to separate the family uh, or people disowning each other, things like that. That's also a different story. Here we say, if someone makes dua, Allah will either answer his prayer promptly, Allah will give you exactly what you asked for, or he will save it for him in the hereafter. I mean, he won't answer your dua, but he will give you something much better in Jannah. Or he will remove some harm because of it. Right? So sometimes we make dua and, oh, you know, oh Allah, give me this, give me that. Sometimes he doesn't give it to you. But instead, let's say there was some sort of, um, you know, difficulty or some sort of calamity that was destined for you, he will remove that. And we may not even know. So, basically it's saying that just because Allah does not give you every single thing you ask for or pray for, don't think that he's not giving you something or that he's not listening or answering. He is doing so many things behind the scene that you just have to have faith. Again, if we, if we made dua for everything and we saw it come right away, that's easy. But if you make dua and we don't, we don't see it, then that's what requires faith. That what's, that's what requires hope. And that's what believers are, right? We are believers in the unseen. We believe in things even though we don't see them. Okay, the second one. Uh, do you know what abundant means? Abundant means a lot. Okay. It means the, uh, the Sahaba said, Let, let's make a lot of dua. A lot or We'll make right. much dua. Yeah. Okay, you can read the second one when you're ready. Okay. Uh, do you know how to pronounce it? Abu Dar? Abu Zar. Abu Dar. Abu uh, Dar. That, like the word, uh, that one, that, that, that. Abu Dar. Abu Dar. Abu, Abu Zar. Abu Zar. Zar, yeah, kind of. It's close. It's like um, uh, you know the th in the word um, uh, bathe. Abu Thar. <laughs> uh, uh, you know the word that or bathe the the. Yeah. Yeah, it's like that. Abu Zar. Abu Zar. Exactly. There you go. Abu Zar reported the messenger of Allah, 
said, uh, Allah Almighty says, whoever comes with a good deed will have the reward of ten like it and even more. Whoever comes with an evil deed will be reckoned that will be rec recompensed for one evil deed like it, or I will forgive him. Whoever draws close to me by the length of a hand, I will draw close to him by the length of an arm. Whoever draws close to me by the length of an arm, I will draw close to him by the length of a fathom. Whoever comes to me walking, I will come to him running. Whoever meets me with enough sins to fill the earth, not associating any idols with me, I will meet him with as much forgiveness. What yeah. does a fat mean in this? Uh, fathom here means um, it's, it's a it's a measurement. So length of an arm. I think fathom might be the length of a, of a whole. Let me see what it means here. Yeah, so it's basically uh, like a whole arm span. Mm. Like from your, if you spread out your arms from your right hand to your left hand, that's how much. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, so let's go to the hadith. So the first part I think we talked about last week, right? Basically, if, if someone does a good deed, Allah gives them 10 rewards minimum. Mm -hmm. Someone does a good deed, Allah multiplies it by 10. And if someone does a bad deed, then Allah doesn't multiply it. It's just one. So you have a, a really easy, you know, like on the day of judgment, when people are weighing their scales, right? You want to weigh the good with the bad. So you want the good to be heavier. So if someone does, if someone even, you know, did so many good deeds and so many bad deeds, but each good deed is worth 10 good deeds, then it's much easier for them to, you know, uh, make 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 the scale heavy and enter Jannah. So mm -hmm. that's why that's why if someone if we ever you know do something bad, ask for forgiveness and it completely wipes it away. Ask for forgiveness, make toba, and do something good. If someone does something bad, ask Allah for forgiveness and do something good. That way you can keep your basically it's like you know our it's like our life is like a you know a school year right or like a semester. So we want our grade at the end of our life to be 100%. So some people get 100%, meaning they have no bad deeds. Some people, they get 80%. Some people get 70%. They need to, you know, they need, uh, they're, they're, they have sins and they have good deeds. And some people, they fail. Some people, they need to, you know, uh, raise their, you could say, raise their grade in the day of judgment and that is not when you want to do that and then besides that look here it says an amazing thing Allah says whoever draws close to me by the length of a hand I will dry, draw close to him by the length of an arm so this doesn't mean physically right like if we say we are close to Allah it doesn't mean physically it means someone someone is trying to make an effort to o obey Allah and to get close to him and to Remember him, Allah. Uh, Allah does even more. It's like it's like, it's like uh, you know if we are trying our best to meet someone or to do something for someone, they do something even more for us. That's what Allah is saying here. So that if someone yeah. just makes a small effort, like just someone who just tries to get close to me this much, I come close to them this much. Someone tries to come close to me this much, I come close to them this much. And if someone is, uh, if someone is just walking to me, I will come running to them. Not physically, but I said if someone is making some effort to come close to me, I will, I will come even closer to them, to them, quick, uh, even quicker, even closer. So this shows that whatever we do, Allah is doing even more for us in return. And this last part, whoever meets me with enough sins to fill the earth and they don't associate any idols, I will meet him with as much forgiveness. Meaning, imagine if someone committed so many sins that you could fill the entire earth with them. And if they believe in Allah and they don't, um, they don't worship other gods, then Allah says that I will forgive, I will forgive him as much. I will forgive him equally. Forgive him the whole earth full of sins worth. Yeah. So this is um, 
this shows how forgiving Allah is. Some some people don't know how forgiving Allah is or how merciful He is. Mm -hmm. Someone commits so many, you know, in in our in our life, if we you know make so many mistakes or we we hurt others or we you know um, disobey others, and we only have a few chances. If we keep doing it, keep doing it, they're gonna leave us. They're gonna forget about us. They're gonna turn away. They won't ever talk to us or listen to us again. Well, Allah is not like that. You, if someone does something a hundred times and they sincerely repent, then Allah will forgive them. And, they get, and then again, if they do the same thing a hundred times, again they ask for forgiveness, Allah will forgive them. All right, so we have uh, three more. Let's quickly finish them so that, that way next week we can start the Khilafah course or discussion. Mm -hmm. Yep, inshallah. Uh, which course again? I forget. Oh, the the topic of uh, the khulafa. Uh, you had requested it, right? The uh, the the four caliphs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So you can you can read the the rest of the uh, hadith here. Prophet Muhammad said that Allah says, "I do not hesitate about anything I do not like." How I hesitate to take the soul of a believer who dislikes death, or I do not like to him suffer. I do not like to make him suffer, but there is no way out of it. Yeah, Allah, so here, yeah here Allah is saying that um, he doesn't like to take the life of believers. He doesn't like to make them go through that pain of death. But it's only because that's the only way they're going to, you know, uh, pass away and then be resurrected. That's why he does that. It just shows okay. Allah doesn't like people to go through pain. All right, let's do uh, let's do the next one quickly. Anas ibn Malik, the servant of the uh, messenger. Anas. Oh, Anas. Anas ibn Malik, the servant of the messenger of Allah. So Allah narrated that the messenger of Allah said, "Verily, Allah is more pleased with the repentance of his slave." And then a person who has lost his camel in a waterless desert, carrying his provision of food and drink. He, having lost all hopes, lies down in shade and is disappointed about his camel. When all of a sudden he finds that that camel stands standing before him. He takes hold of his, of his, of his reins and then out of boundless joy blurts out, O oh Allah, you are my slave and I am your Lord. He commits this mistake out of extreme joy. So imagine you're in a desert and there's nothing. You're just stranded in the desert and you have your camel. And on your camel, you have all of your food and your drink and your belongings. Okay. And you go and you find some place to rest. So you rest and then you, you sleep. And then when you wake up, your camel is gone and all your food is gone and your water is gone and your belongings are gone. Right. Imagine how stressful that is. Right. Uh -huh. And then imagine again you go and you sleep and you wake up and then your camel is back. The camel is back and it has all your food and your water and you know like now you'll be able to survive. And out of that extreme, you know, joy and happiness, you know, you you make you you don't even know you don't even realize what you're saying, right? This person is so happy that he says. Is the, he, he's so happy he wants to say oh Allah you are my lord and I'm your slave but he's so happy that his mind is not even thinking he says oh Allah uh, you are my slave and I'm your lord that's how happy is he, he he's so happy he can't even talk properly so uh, Prophet Sallallahu said that when a person commits a sin or they uh, make a mistake okay and then they come back to Allah it's like Allah it's like the person who loses their camel and the camel comes back. That's how happy Allah is when, you know, that's how happy Allah is when someone asks for forgiveness, but they come back to him, right? right. That's, how, that's how happy Allah is. So imagine like this person is so happy that he makes a mistake. He, he speaks incorrectly. He's just so happy. That's how Allah, that's how happy Allah is when, when we ask for forgiveness. And let's do the last one. Uh, Umar uh, ibn al-Khattab reported some prisoners were brought 
in front of the Prophet Muhammad and a woman was among them who was breastfeeding. Whenever she found a child among the prisoners, she would take it to her chest and nurse it. Prophet said to us, do you think uh, this woman could throw her child in the fire? We said, no, not if she is able to stop it. The Prophet Muhammad said, Allah is more merciful to his servants than a mother is to her child. Yeah, so this shows that, like, you, you probably have heard that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more merciful, more kind, more caring to his servants than 70 times of a mother. Okay, so a mother who is, you know, holding their little baby to them, to their chest, would they ever be able to throw that baby in the fire? Or they would not even be able to harm that baby at, at all let alone throw them in a burning fire. So the the Sahaba said, there's no way that this loving, caring mother could ever do that. So Allah, he said that Allah is more merciful to his servants. He's more caring, he's more loving to his servants than that. That you know, if, 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 if there was a way out, he would never do it. But it's only the, uh, the ones who disbelieve in him, the ones who disobey him, then those are the ones he punishes. Otherwise, Allah SWT doesn't want to punish. He doesn't want to uh, harm or cause difficulty. Mm -hmm. okay, so, Alhamdulillah, we concluded the list of verses and ayahs. This was just to show, you know, some characteristics of Allah, how merciful He is, how kind He is. A lot of people don't know these verses. They never read mm -hmm. them. They never read the translation. They never read these hadith. They don't realize that, hey, if I make a mistake, I can ask forgiveness. And Allah is always there. He's always there to help me. He's always there to listen to me. So that's very important as a believer. We have to realize that even if no one is there for us, no one is helping us, whether it's our parents or friends, community, Allah is there and He is He is extremely loving, caring, and happy to to um He's happy to fulfill the, the needs and the wants of His servants. Okay, so I'm low, we, we finished that. Um, do you have any questions, Hassan? Uh, no, but... Ji, salam alaikum. Salam Haan, ji, I'm Hassan's mother. How are you? Alhamdulillah, how are you doing? Alhamdulillah. Uh, I was just wondering if you will start the lecture next week, inshallah. Inshallah. So, can we like divide the class into half, like first half, آپ قرآن کی تفسیر اگر شروع سے شروع کر دیں سورہ فاتحہ سے جسٹ اے شارٹ تفسیر سو یہ ماشاء اللہ پڑھتا تو ہے قاری صاحب سے تھری ٹائمز اے ویک لیکن جس طرح تھوڑا سا بچے کو اندازہ ہوتا ہے نا کہ وہ جو پڑھا ہے وٹ ڈز دیٹ مینس اور ہم ڈیلی لائف میں اس کو کیسے اپلائی کر سکتے ہیں آن ہز لیول اگر آپ تھوڑا شارٹ تفسیر ساتھ شروع کر دیں اور پھر ان دا سیکنڈ ہاف آپ خلفۂ راشدین کی جو بھی ہسٹری اور جس طرح سے بھی ہے وہ پڑھا دیں چلے ٹھیک ہے تھینک یو سو مچ Yeah, okay. Okay, take care, son. Inshallah. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.